Like Mayor Duggan said, the key to everything has been testing. Joining us now is Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you so much for making time to be here tonight. I appreciate your time. Well, thanks for having me on, Rachel. We didn't really have any choice on the testing. We got hit so fast that by the second week, a quarter of our police department was out on quarantine, and it was uh, shocking how fast the virus was spreading. But uh, we got obsessed about the testing off the bat. We did it starting in the police department where we took the officers through, and if they were positive, we got the medical care. If they were negative, we got them back to work. Uh, and we brought the infection rate down so dramatically uh, that we then looked and said, where is our worst problem? And it's in the uh, nursing homes. And we've now tested every single one of the 2,000 uh, nursing home residents in this city. And, and this is the problem. A quarter of the people with no symptoms were positive. So think about it. If you're a nursing home administrator and people without symptoms are spreading the disease, you have no way of isolating them. Uh, and it really is the reason uh, why rapid testing is at the center of what this country's got to do to beat this thing. Are you going to keep testing people in an ongoing way, both the residents and the staff? I imagine this is both a big logistical investment, but it's also expensive. Having a, a snapshot round of tests is incredibly valuable, but obviously the most value would be if you could continually test. Oh, absolutely. We're, we're doing 1,500 tests a day. Every single worker going to work in grocery stores and uh, uh, drug stores and gas stations were testing. So we took the state fairgrounds that has 140 acres, uh, and we're testing 1,500 people a day, uh, and it's making a huge difference. Three weeks ago, uh, we had about the highest death rate in the country. Now it's dropped 80 percent, and half of our hospital beds are empty. Uh, the people of this city have yeah. definitely committed to social distancing. Uh, you don't have to explain to Detroiters that if an African-American gets COVID-19, you're two to three times more likely to die than a Caucasian. And the people of this city have embraced uh, the social distancing uh, commitments. And when you can keep the infectious from the non-infectious by the rapid tests, uh, there are the tools here, but we brought the rate down uh, very, very fast. If other um, leaders are right now listening to you, wishing that they had access to rapid testing to be able to test all of their nursing homes and thinking through how they might be able to walk through, how they might be able to do the logistics um, in their own communities, given what you've been able to do in Detroit, do you have any advice in terms of other public officials who may be wanting to do the same kind of thing that you do, specifically thinking about nursing home residents? Well, for nine years before I got elected mayor, I ran the Detroit Medical Center, the major hospital system here, So, and a number of my team came with me. So we had a significant advantage. We were running a big hospital system during the H1N1 uh, uh, issue in 2009. But we don't spend a lot of time on politics. I'm all day on the phone with labs, with doctors, uh, and so is much of uh, uh, my team. And, you know, where are the swabs? Where are the uh, medium? Where are the vials? Who's got the lab capacity? Uh, and then I had the big advantage that Dan Gilbert and Quicken Loans is our major employer here, the people who normally sell you mortgages. They took 40 people and switch them over to a call center. And the reason we can run through 1,000, 1,200 people a day is because they call the Quicken call center and make appointments. So it comes through that the average person spends 15 or, or 20 minutes, but uh, it's a lot of boring details. But given the, the stakes, uh, it just was something we felt uh, we needed to do. And the reaction we've gotten notes from the nursing home uh, now that the nursing home administrators now are moving to senior citizen uh, traditional housing, now they know who's infectious and who's not. Uh, they're moving very quickly to separate folks, and we're seeing the infection rates go down. And most importantly, we're seeing the number of deaths drop dramatically. Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan, thanks for helping us understand this. I feel like what you've been doing in Detroit is different enough from what a lot of other cities have done that it really uh, deserves national attention. Thanks for helping us understand what you've done. Good luck. Thanks for having me on, Richard. All right. Um, 
uh, I want to leave you tonight with one thing that has just happened uh, over the course of this evening, as if we were not already living through a Ripley's Believe It or Not episode turned dark. Um, today, you should know that as the president toured a mask factory in Arizona, while not himself wearing a mask, um, there was something going on with the background music uh, while he toured the plant that you should just know about. Just listen. This is the material that traps the particulates. This is the material that traps the particulates, Mr. President. This is how the mask works. I see you're not wearing a mask, and neither of any of us here. In the background, live and let die. Playing really loudly, Guns N' Roses. Sometimes the universe is too on point for me. That does it again for us. I did this. That really happened. That does it for me tonight and maybe for a long time. I'll see you again tomorrow. Now it's time for The Last Word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Good evening, Lawrence. Good evening, Rachel. And I, what I've been wondering about is, does the factory normally play music? Or was that greeting music for the President of the United States? And if it was, who chose that? For the moment, he's being shown what the mask protects you from while he mm -hmm. and all of the men around him are not wearing masks and pointing each other's faces at each other. I mean, really? If it, was, if, it was, if it was coincidence, it means there's a god. If it was not coincidence, it means there is a very smart would-be DJ in that part of Arizona who deserves all of our thanks. And, and Rachel, there's one other thing in, that, in the video that I don't get. I don't understand why he was wearing the glasses. That, it, that everybody wears in factories like that. He doesn't obey any of those rules. He doesn't wear masks when you're supposed to wear a mask. Why was he bothering to wear the glasses? I don't get it. Maybe he thinks that's where the infection part goes. I oh, don't, you okay. know, or maybe he's comfortable right. wearing goggles for specialty things. I don't, okay. I don't, I, I can't even guess. I shouldn't speculate. You don't have to, Rachel. You can go home now. Thank you. <laughs> Good night, Rachel. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> She's had a tough day. Every one of these are tough days. And it was a tough day of sorts, but maybe not really for Rick Wilson. Because Rick Wilson was one of the targets of Donald Trump's tweeted hatred today. Rick Wilson will join us at the end of the hour to show us what he did, along with Kellyanne Conway's husband, George Conway, to make Donald Trump so very angry at him today. And Lori Garrett is the journalist who has taught us more about coronavirus than any other journalist. She will join us tonight. She always changes and improves my understanding of where we are in the coronavirus pandemic. She told us that this was coming. She told us this was coming and it was going to be bad long before New York was told it was going to be so bad that everyone was going to have to stay home. Lori Garrett knew all of that was coming. Lori Garrett now says that no one who was thinking about or talking about reopening businesses or schools has a strategy to guide that kind of decision making. Lori Garrett will join us later in the hour. An NYU medical school is now running human trials on a possible vaccine for coronavirus. We'll have an exclusive report on the NYU vaccine later in this hour. You'll hear a video interview of a woman who has volunteered for the human trial of that vaccine. That'll be later in the hour. We have two stories tonight to begin with that are actually the same story. The suppression of information about the coronavirus pandemic by Donald Trump and his administration. That's the one story that these two stories support. One story is gonna create the most important congressional hearing since the impeachment hearings against Donald Trump. We'll be joined later in this hour by Congressman Peter Welch who will be participating in that hearing when Dr. Rick, Rick Bright testifies about his whistleblower complaint, which was made public today. Dr. Bright says that he was removed from his job and reassigned because he was urgently warning the Trump administration in January 
that this country was not prepared for the coronavirus pandemic that was coming. Dr. Bright warned his boss, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, that we were going to face a medical supply crisis. He specified exactly what we urgently needed to do, including a surge in funding for medical supplies and preparations for the coronavirus pandemic. And the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar's response to that was to block Dr. Bright from being allowed to attend the next meeting about the coronavirus. And then he eventually, Alex Azar, got rid of him entirely. And now that's gonna happen to the White House Coronavirus Task Force. Gonna get rid of them too. The White House has not denied reporting today that Donald Trump is going to get rid of the Coronavirus Task Force. That's the other story about the suppression of true information by the Trump administration during this coronavirus pandemic. And when he was asked today about dismanding the coronavirus task force, Donald Trump said this. Mike Pence and the task force have done a great job, but we're now looking at a little bit of a different form, and that form is safety and opening, and we'll, uh, we'll have a different group probably set up for that. So that's it. The war is over for the wartime president, as he called himself. He apparently has defeated the coronavirus, and now he needs another task force that is not dedicated to stopping the coronavirus. It is dedicated to putting more and more people in danger of infection by getting them back to work without any strategy whatsoever. Also today, Donald Trump said that Dr. Anthony Fauci will never be allowed to testify to the House of Representatives because it's controlled by Democrats, but Dr. Fauci will be allowed to testify to the Senate once because it's controlled by Republicans. Donald Trump didn't kill his coronavirus task force today. He killed it the day that he said this. And then I see the disinfectant where it knocks it out in a minute, one minute. And is there a way we can do something like that uh, by injection inside or, or almost a cleaning? Because you see it gets on the lungs and it does a tremendous number of the lungs. So it'd be interesting to check that so that you're going to have to use medical doctors with. But it sounds, it sounds interesting to me. So we'll see. But the whole concept of the light, the way it kills it in one minute, that's, uh, that's pretty powerful. Ever, have you ever heard of that, uh, the uh, heat and the light? Relative to certain viruses, yes, but relative to this virus? Not as a treatment. I mean, certainly fever yeah. is a good thing when you have a fever. It helps your body respond. Mm -hmm. But not as I've not seen heat or I, I think it's a great thing to look at. I mean, you know. Okay. Not as a treatment. That was the best that she could do. Not as a treatment. That is the presidential campaign moment that America should never forget. And it was a campaign moment because Donald Trump had turned the White House briefing room into his 2020 version of a campaign rally. Donald Trump believed that his command of television cameras in the White House briefing gave him a huge advantage over Joe Biden. There was no polling evidence of that. The polling indicated that Donald Trump was making the country increasingly uncomfortable and dissatisfied and eventually scared by his job performance. Then came the moment when Donald Trump talked about ingesting disinfectant. He didn't know he was talking about suicide because the president's ignorance is boundless. But once the news media made it clear, even to Donald Trump watching TV in the White House, how foolish his comment was, even Donald Trump knew that he could never do that again. And so he stopped the White House briefings. And for Donald Trump, the whole point of the coronavirus task force was to make it a TV show. And now that the TV show is canceled, he doesn't need the cast hanging around anymore. You will not miss these briefings. They were dominated by Donald Trump's misinformation and lies. There were occasional notes of reality clearly inserted by Dr. Anthony Fauci. But Dr. Deborah Birx chose another course that made her more popular with Donald Trump. She avoided any phrasing that could ever be interpret, interpreted as a possible direct contradiction of Donald Trump. 
And she once actually told a television interviewer that Donald Trump was so good at reading all of the briefing materials that she presented to him when we know that Donald Trump does not read anything. And her very, very worst moment was the moment that you just saw when the president turns to her and says, have you ever heard of that? And Dr. Birx does not say, absolutely not, that could be suicidal, no one should do anything that you just suggested. Dr. Birx's answer to Donald Trump when he said, have you ever heard of that, was not as a treatment. And so no, we will not miss Donald Trump's lies, we will not, not miss Donald Trump's suicidal prescriptions, and we will not miss Dr. Birx's refusal to fulfill her duty to warn that what you just heard was insane. Dr. Birx had that duty as a physician and as a public health official to warn people publicly as soon as Donald Trump said that, that what they heard was lethally dangerous. Dr. Birx and Dr. Fauci will no doubt continue to do good work behind closed doors tracking the virus. And you will continue to be fully informed by medical experts who know everything there is to know about this subject, and you see them on this network every day. In a serious White House, the Coronavirus Task Force would be delivering better information for you than the immunologists and researchers and physicians who appear on this program. But that's not where we live now. We live in a country now where the best medical information you can get about what's happening with this coronavirus is by watching this network. This is the best information available. And that is not what you were getting from the Trump TV rallies in the White House briefing room. In that briefing room, you were never getting the job, the treatment that the White House task force was supposed to deliver. Dr. Eric Blutinger is an emergency physician at Mount Sinai Queens Hospital. I never imagined going into the medical profession thinking that on a given shift I could receive a diagnosis or a medical illness that could eventually kill me um, and harbor itself internally so insidiously and quietly. But that is the new battle that we're facing in coronavirus. I was crushed emotionally. The, our hospital system was doing a phenomenal job trying to mobilize resources and, in, and checking in with all of us individually to make sure that we mentally were prepared for the onslaught that was to come. There was really no end in sight at the beginning of this. And that made it much difficult to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Leading off our discussion tonight, Dr. Ashish Jha, the director of the Harvard Global Health Institute, and John Hyland, a national affairs analyst for NBC News and MSNBC. He is the co-host of Showtime's The Circus and the editor-in-chief of The Recount. And Dr. Jha, I, I want to get your sense of where we are tonight. Uh, it seems like uh, New York is on a downslope, but it is it is it in, in fact the case that the rest of the country, when you look at the country as a whole, we're at a plateau. We are not actually moving downward. Yes, yeah, so thanks for having me on, Lawrence. Um, what we have is a tale of two countries. Um, we have New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, uh, parts of other places uh, that where the cases are declining, um, Ohio, California, um, where if you put them in aggregate, the number of cases is declining. Um, and then you have the rest of the country, the second half of this story, um, where it's not just flat, it's actually rising. Now, not everywhere. Some places it is flat, some places uh, it's low, but aggregate, the rest of the country is increasing. And so this whole idea that, you know, and that's why on average it comes out flat, but this whole idea that the country is ready to open up uh, really does not comply with the facts and data on the ground. But, Doctor, what about regions of the country? Uh, Governor Cuomo is talking about possible upstate regions of New York, uh, New York State, being allowed more kinds of public activities than the downstate region and New York City. 
Yeah, so look, I think we can have um, very localized um, policies. I don't think that's unreasonable. Uh, if some parts of upstate New York really have few or no cases or substantially declining cases, but I think they're going to have to worry about things like, so what happens when part of the, of the state opens up and people from New York City get in the car and drive up there? Uh, because people move, and people move within states, they move across states. So I'm, I'm not opposed at all to kind of regional-focused uh, policies that are driven by data and science. I just think we have to be careful about how far we push that. Uh, John Heilman, the uh, the White House uh, coronavirus task force seems to be disbanded. We will not be subject to those uh, end of day, two hour performances anymore until I guess Donald Trump gets too bored and decides to go out there and try something else on television. Yeah, Lawrence, and I think um, it's a. I, I appreciated your 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 opening. Uh, to the show tonight is grim, um, and I think appropriately grim, uh, given where we are and given the kind of extraordinary back-to-back uh, -back nature of the last two days where we, where we learn about, on one side, projections and models and forecasts within the administration that suggest that May and June could be extraordinarily ugly in the United States when it comes to coronavirus. Um, and the very next day, uh, the White House announces that it's shutting down uh, the coronavirus task force. I agree with you. I think the task force and its public relations orientation has been close to useless in terms of actually getting anything done. And yet on the political side, to see Donald Trump at this moment uh, having a, what can only be described as a, as a mission accomplished moment, if, if that is in fact where we're going, shutting down this coronavirus task force and basically saying what he's now saying, which is, you know, a lot of people are going to get hurt. Some of them are going to get hurt really badly going forward, but we must reopen this economy. The economy is key to him politically. And at this point, he seems to be essentially be saying, uh, I don't really care about public health to the extent I ever cared about it. We're moving on from that. We're into a new phase. And I think it's extraordinarily dangerous, obviously, for the country, but also, I think, extraordinarily reckless politically for the president if his hope is to get reelected. John, I think one of the last numbers that Donald Trump himself, in his own imaginary projections, offered in the White House briefing room was 50,000. He was saying that he thought they might actually hold... Right. Uh, total American deaths to 50,000. Uh, is it just that Donald Trump doesn't want to go yeah. into that room anymore when the numbers are going up and up, and, and his uh, administration has some projections that indicate that the death rate could double, uh, in, be doubling in the month of June, and they could be announcing 3,000 per day? Yes, I think, I think you know, uh, Lawrence, we've talked about various strategies that there are tactics that, that President Trump has tried in the course of 2020 with respect to, to COVID-19. The first was downplaying. Then we had blame shifting. And now, more recently, we've been in the, the moment of goalpost shifting, where that 50,000 projection that he gave that one day in the White House was, we actually got to 50,000 that week. It was like a Monday that he said that he thought we might, it might only be 50,000 deaths. And we, had, we actually crossed over the 50,000 threshold within four days of when he said that. And I think, you know, we've now seen him ratchet that uh, that goalpost, push that goalpost further and further down the field. It's now, apparently, he's, he's setting 100,000 as the marker. But I think even Donald Trump, who never tires of mendacity, never t tires of lying, never tires of innumerateness, uh I think even Donald Trump, and never tires of goalpost shifting, I think his arms are getting a little tired. Uh, and he's starting to realize that it's getting to the point where even by his standards, it's too ludicrous, ludicrous to continue uh, with this effort. And it's not only ludicrous, but politically counterproductive. Dr. Jarrah, let me get your reaction to the uh, apparent closing down of the White House task force. Uh, they will continue to do their work behind closed doors. Is it going to matter that they don't have that public uh, display every day? So, Lawrence, I, I agree with you that a lot of what was shared in those uh, two-hour-long events was not very useful. But some of it was, especially when Dr. Fauci spoke and Dr. Burke spoke. Um, that was useful information. And the signal to the country of you know, we're uh, not doing that anymore, I think is really harmful. And the way I've described this is, you know, we are, to use a baseball analogy, we are, you know, kind of in the second or third inning of a, of a baseball game. And what it feels like is the manager has decided just to leave. And that's a problem. We need our manager to get us through the game. Dr. Ashish Jar, John Heilman, thank you both for starting us off tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you.
And when we come back, global pandemic expert and journalist Lori Garrett has been one of the indispensable voices in our coronavirus coverage. She will join us next on what she says is the most important question that is not being asked, and it affects everything. Testing, tracing, reopening. Lori Garrett will give us what we should be thinking of next. When you shop for your home at Wayfair, you get way more than free shipping. You get thousands of items you need to your door fast, the way it works best for you. I'll take that. Hey, honey, no. Even the big stuff. You get a delivery experience you can always count on. You get your perfect find at a price to match on your schedule. Yes! You get free two-day shipping on the things that make your home feel like you. Wayfair, way more than furniture. I just love hitting the open road and telling people that Liberty Mutual customizes your insurance. So you only pay for what you need. <laughs> only pay for what you need. Liberty, 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 Liberty. Engines are restarting. Park is shifting to drive. And to get things moving again, we're offering 0% financing for 72 months and no payments for 120 days. Plus, the freedom to shop and buy online. So you can meet the road ahead with confidence. Chrysler Dodge Jeep and Ram. Helping you drive forward. Saturdays happen. Pain happens. Ooh. Aleve it. Aleve is proven stronger and longer on pain than Tylenol. When pain happens, Aleve it. All day strong. Want your brain better? Unlike ordinary memory supplements, Nareva has clinically proven ingredients that fuel five indicators of brain performance. Memory, focus, accuracy, learning, and concentration. Try Nareva for 30 days and see the difference. What does it mean to be America's most reliable network? At Verizon, it means putting those who serve first with our best pricing ever. $30 per line for all nurses, teachers, first responders, military, and their families. Because the people we rely on deserve a network they can rely on. For all the hardwoods doubling as dance floors. Refrigerators hiding secret snacks. Sunrooms used for afternoon naps. And backyards primed for picnics. Protect the pure joy of home with Terminix. Our experts are committed to keeping pests like termites, rodents, roaches, and mosquitoes out of your home. Always backed by the Terminix promise to protect your home for all the love it holds. <laughs> it just doesn't ignite the light. <laughs> Not enough space for your favorite stuff? We've got an easier way to move and store what you love. Hang on, honey. Hi, Ben from Make Space. We'll store it, keep it safe, and when you need it back, just use the app. Such a better way to do storage. Get the fire stairs away! Make Space is storage without the struggle. Pickup and delivery on demand. We provide the bins. Use code STRESSFREE for $100 off. In his last New York Times column, Frank Bruni wrote this about Lori Garrett. She predicted the coronavirus. What does she foresee next? As the global response focuses on testing, contact tracing, and safe reopenings, Lori Garrett now says that the people in government who are trying to make those decisions about reopening certain businesses and schools and recreational activities are not talking about the most important issue, which is the strategic goal. Is the goal to stop COVID-19 in your city? Is it to stop COVID-19 in your state? Is it to stop COVID-19 in the United States? The world? We're hearing a lot of discussion of tactics, but no discussion of goals. 
Joining us now is Lori Garrett, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist covering global pandemics. She is a former senior fellow for global health at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, Lori, uh, you make this point about the distinction between tactics and goals, tactics and what is your ultimate strategy, uh, and it's the ultimate strategy that you're not hearing. Well, anybody who's ever been in the military knows the difference between strategy and tactics. And most people in sports know the difference between strategy and tactics. But somehow, when it comes to national policy, we, we've completely eliminated that distinction. So all of the arguments, the discussions, the debates that we hear across America, whether it's angrily storming your state capital to protest lockdowns or its demands for test, 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 test. These are all just tactics. They're not what is your long-term strategy? What is your strategic goal? And we don't have a national strategic goal. We have a president's goal, get reelected. We have a Wall Street goal, get the economy going again. We have you know, certain public health institutions' goals of control the epidemic in my community or in my region. But the real only goal that matters, the only goal that really gets us anywhere as a planet and as individuals is let's get rid of this virus. And if the goal is let's get rid of the virus so it doesn't become a new permanent feature threatening humanity as HIV did, as Ebola has, as other viruses that have emerged in the last 30 years have successfully done, then we need a coordinated global strategy. And the United States needs a national strategy. And instead, we're going precisely in the opposite direction, where all the burden for strategic planning and for judging which tactics best feed which strategic goals is placed on the shoulders of mayors and governors who are weighed down by uh, strapped budgets, by uh, years of inadequate hiring in their public health ranks, by the tremendous hysteria in cities that are overwhelmed by patient burden, they're not in the best position to come up with an international strategy or a national or perhaps even a regional strategy. Um, and so we're, we're, we're blindly you know, testing over here, test, test, test. Uh, what kind of test? Test for what? What are we looking for? When I test, am I imagining that every single employee walking into my factory will have been tested before entering the door? Am I gonna do that every single day, every third day, every fifth day? You don't have to go very far before you realize this is chaos. This is not get rid of the virus. This is short term, come up with a tactic that lets me reopen a school or reopen a business, um, but the virus will still be out there and it will still be coming back in wave after wave in the future. Are you going to shut down and reopen and shut down and reopen and shut down and reopen forever? L Lori, what does a strategy of getting rid of the virus look like? Well, there's really only way, one way to do that. That's have an effective vaccine that is specifically designed not for use in wealthy countries, but for use in the whole world, which, you know, in my book means one dose because the complication of tracking everybody down a second time for a booster dose is overwhelming. In my book, it means it can't require refrigeration because a whole lot of the planet doesn't have electricity and refrigerated vaccines go bad. Uh, it requires creating a profit motive scheme of some sort that that brings the industry to the table without imagining the kind of profit returns they usually want from pharmaceuticals. Uh, and that means coming up with agreements with the World Trade Organization and with um, the trade-related intellectual property agreements and all sorts of instruments of international law. And then finally, it means mobilizing a global response, internationally led, 
internationally supported, getting into some of the toughest places on earth, getting the Taliban on board, allowing vaccination in Afghanistan and Pakistan, getting Islamist groups on board in the Middle East, getting all sorts of insurgent groups on board in Central America. I mean, you've got to have an all out political and social and legal and business commitment that is led from the highest levels in order to achieve this. And we can't even get the darn Security Council to hold a meeting about COVID. Uh, now we know how far off we are uh, from the right strategy. Lori Garrett, thank you once again for joining us once again. I've been taking notes for at, during everything you were just saying, as usual. I learn every time you join us. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you. And when we come back, Dr. Rick Bright's written complaint takes us inside what it was like for him trying to tell the truth inside the Trump administration about the coronavirus pandemic and why he lost his job in the process. That will be the subject of a hearing next week in the House of Representatives, the most important hearing since the impeachment hearings. USAA was made for right now. Right now is a time for action. So for a second time, we're giving members a credit on their auto insurance because it's the right thing to do. We're also giving payment relief options to eligible members so they can take care of things like groceries before they worry about their insurance or credit card bills. Right now is a time to take care of what matters most, like we've done together so many times before. Discover all the ways we're helping members at usaa.com slash coronavirus. Let's be honest. Quitting smoking is hard. Like quitting every Monday hard. Quitting feels so big. So try making it smaller, and you'll be surprised at how easily starting small can lead to something big. Start stopping with Nicorette. Are you excited? Definitely am. Fire it up. Yeah! Hello. Let's get into some trouble. Must be my lucky day. <laughs> I want to go to there. There are millions of people all over the world right now making incredible things from their homes. Always open, still making. Shop Etsy, find joy. New Tide Power Pods one-up the cleaning power of liquid. Can it one-up whatever they're doing? For sure. Seriously? One-up the power of liquid, one-up the toughest stains. Any further questions? Uh -uh. One-up the power of liquid with New Tide Power Pods. Have you ever seen something so beautiful that all you could say was, wow? Beaches, Turks, and Caicos, where anything is possible because everything is included. Wow. Get up to 65% off. Call 1-800-BEACHES. I have the power to lower my blood sugar and A1C. Because I can still make my own insulin. And Trulicity activates my body to release it like it's supposed to. What's weekly Trulicity is for type 2 diabetes. It's not insulin. It starts acting from the first dose, and it lowers risk of heart attack, stroke, or death in people with known heart disease or multiple risk factors. Trulicity isn't for people with type 1 diabetes or diabetic ketoacidosis. Don't take Trulicity if you're allergic to it. You or your family have medullary thyroid cancer or have multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome type 2. Stop Trulicity and call your doctor right away if you have an allergic reaction, a lump or swelling in your neck, severe stomach pain, changes in vision, or diabetic retinopathy. Serious side effects may include pancreatitis. Taking Trulicity with sulfonylurea or insulin raises low blood sugar risk. Side effects include nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, belly pain, and decreased appetite, which lead to dehydration and may worsen kidney problems. I have it within me to lower my A1C. Ask your doctor about Trulicity. Are you frustrated losing your Wi-Fi connection when you are too far away from your router? We have a solution. Nextbox, the Wi-Fi extender that can boost your Wi-Fi signal to cover up to 1,000 square feet. And it's easy to set up. Simply push a button on your extender and your router and say goodbye to Wi-Fi dead spots. Nextbox is available exclusively on Amazon. For a new low price, go to Amazon.com slash Nextbox or by phone at 855-741-1000.
love Latisse? Now, with Rory, you can get authentic Latisse prescribed by a doctor online. If Latisse is right for you, we'll deliver it straight to your door with free two-day shipping. Get the Latisse you love and more with Rory. Get started with your free online visit today at hellorory.com slash TV. Next Thursday, we're going to see the most important congressional hearing since the impeachment hearings against Donald Trump. Our next guest, Congressman Peter Welch, will be at that hearing when Dr. Rick Bright testifies about his whistleblower complaint that was made public today, which accuses the Trump administration of government wrongdoing, including, quote, violation of law, rule, or regulation, abuse of authority, censorship related to scientific research. The whistleblower complaint alleges that all of those violations led to, quote, substantial and specific danger to public safety. Dr. Bright says he was removed from his job and reassigned because he warned Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar and Assistant Secretary Robert Kadlik in January that the administration was not ready to fight the coronavirus. The complaint says, quote, anticipating the urgency and magnitude of the threat and knowing the lead times needed to develop new drugs, diagnostics, and vaccines, Dr. Bright pressed for urgent access to funding personnel and clinical specimens, including viruses, which he emphasized were all critically necessary to begin development of life-saving medicines needed in the likely event that the virus spread outside of Southeast Asia. Asia. Secretary Azar and, Kad and Dr. Kadlec responded with surprise at Dr. Bright's dire predictions and urgency and asserted that the United States would be able to contain the virus and keep it out of the United States. Dr. Bright was later told that, quote, his request for urgent funding at the meeting on January 23rd set off quite a crap storm after the meeting. Joining our discussion now is Democratic Congressman Peter Welsh of Vermont. He's a member of the Intelligence Oversight Energy and Commerce Committee, and is at, which called for an inspector general, the inspector general to investigate Dr. Bright's ouster last month. Uh, Congressman Welsh, thank you very much for joining us tonight. It is uh, a stunning day when we get this full uh, whistleblower complaint, uh, just page upon page upon page. Uh, of damning uh, indictment of the Trump administration. Well, it is. You know, I want to step back for a minute. This virus is incredibly powerful, <clears throat> and it's a threat to all of us. We've lost more lives in America than we lost in the Vietnam War, and that's in two months. But there's two approaches to leadership on this. And one we're seeing with many of our governors, some Republicans, some Democrat tell people what they need to know and what we all need to do. The other, which we're seeing from President Trump, is tell people what they want to hear. And that's where you have the president acting as a pharmacist, telling us what a cure is, telling us that it's no big deal. And what happened with Dr. Bright is that he is in the camp of let's be real, let's tell facts, let's deal with the truth. That's very inconvenient when you have a president whose view is, I want to tell people what they want to hear. And what President Trump understands about human nature, all of us are terrified about this virus. So if he goes into uh, the White House podium with the pres presidential seal and tells his hydro uh, hydro uh, 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 <laughs> hydrochlorine, I'm getting the name wrong, but uh, Dr. Trump apparently gets it right, uh, people want to hear it. And it's very inconvenient for the president when a very respected person like Dr. Bright says, wait a minute, that's not right. Yes, uh, the uh, hydroxychloroquine, the, the anti-malaria drug that uh, Dr. Bright was warning about, one of his concerns was that uh, the Trump administration was literally trying to flood New Jersey and New York with this drug. 
after importing it from manufacturers in Pakistan and India that the FDA had never checked in any way, never been to any of those factories. Uh, and so he was very concerned about the basically to begin with the quality control and then the fact uh, that he did not believe this should be generally prescribed. It could he only thought it should be prescribed in rare instances in hospitals by doctors in hospitals. Well, that's it. That's exactly right. And what the president is doing is he's giving false hope uh, because we want to have a cure. But what the president is not doing is what all of us know, all of the public health folks know needs to be done. We have to have testing that should be led by the federal government. We can't have 50 states and 50 governors coming up with their tests. We have to have contact tracing, and that requires that we have like a, a AmeriCorps VISTA, the core of 100,000 people who, if I test positive, those folks contact anybody I've been in contact with, and they're tested. And then we have to have a capacity to isolate people. That's why it's been so successful in suppressing this disease in places like Taiwan and South Korea and Singapore. That's what the president can do, but he'd prefer to come up with a hocus-pocus cure. And then anyone who raises the question, a dedicated public servant like Dr. Bright, they're out. And that's the pattern, of course, of President Trump. If you're an inspector general, you're gone. Congressman, do you expect uh, partial attendance at the hearing next week? Do you expect it to be just the members who can maybe uh, reach Washington by car? Well, my hope is that there'll be partial attendance, but also it's about time for us to get into the modern age and to do uh, a, a virtual uh, presence as well. They're starting to do that in the Senate. So we've got to modernize to the modern situation. But this, this hearing is extremely important. And it's important because... The governors out there, and there's a lot of Republican governors, they're playing it straight. They're treating our their constituents like adults. And by the way, our governor, Republican Governor Scott in Vermont is doing that. It's just the facts. And when people know that you're leveling with not hocus pocus, then they're gonna cooperate and we're gonna get on top of this, but it's gonna be tough. Congressman Peter Welch, thank you very much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And when we come back, we have some exclusively reported details on the human trial of a coronavirus vaccine that has begun in New York City. That's next. Hey, safe driver, save 40 percent. Guys, guys. Safe driver, save 40 percent. Safe driver, save 40 percent. Safe driver, save 40 percent. That's safe driver, save 40 percent. It is. That's safe driver, save 40 percent. It's right there. It's him. Safe drivers do save 40 percent. Click or call for a quote today. This is Vince's desk. Vince is working, just not here. He's on a new project. It's a lot of late nights, early check-ins, even a few tears. Fortunately, his employer gave him plenty of time to get it right. And that support for Vince the dad helped Vince the employee return to work with a whole new purpose. Ultimate Software helps you treat your employees better because how you treat people changes everything. For people living with HIV, keep being you and ask your doctor about Victarvi. Victarvi is a complete one pill, once a day treatment used for HIV in certain adults. It's not a cure, but with one small pill, Victarvi fights HIV to help you get to and stay undetectable. That's when the amount of virus is so low, it cannot be measured by a lab test. Research shows people who take HIV treatment every day and get to and stay undetectable can no longer transmit HIV through sex. Serious side effects can occur, including kidney problems and kidney failure. Rare, life-threatening side effects include a buildup of lactic acid and liver problems. Do not take Bictarvi if you take dofetilide or rifampin. Tell your doctor about all the medicines and supplements you take if you are pregnant or breastfeeding, or if you have kidney or liver problems, including hepatitis. If you have hepatitis B, do not stop taking Victarvi without talking to your doctor. Common side effects were diarrhea, nausea, and headache. If you're living with HIV, keep loving who you are and ask your doctor if Victarvi is right for you. Fact. Emily hasn't bought groceries in weeks. So how is she creating this masterpiece? Her freezer is stocked with daily harvest. That's how. Chef-crafted food, organic ingredients. Delivered to your door. Ready in minutes. See for yourself at dailyharvest.com. 
Go to dailyharvest.com and get started today. When the threat from fire and water damage is at its biggest, hand the cleanup over to the team that stays with you until even the smallest detail is taken care of. 1-800-CERVPRO, the number one choice in commercial cleanup and restoration. Jeff, you make smart choices, but you're getting burned. Huh? By your bank. With the Marcus by Goldman Sachs online savings account, you could earn more interest in one month than in one year with the largest banks. I am getting burned. Mm-hmm. Well, I gotta do something about this. Probably should. You could earn more interest in one month than in one year with the largest banks. You can money with Marcus by Goldman Sachs. When your V-neck looks more like a U-neck, that's when you know it's half-washed. Downy helps prevent stretching by conditioning fibers so clothes look newer, longer. Downy, and it's done. When managing diabetes, you can't always stop for a finger stick. With the Freestyle Libre 14-day system, a continuous glucose monitor, you don't have to. With a painless one-second scan, you can check your glucose with a smartphone or reader so you can stay in the moment no matter where you are or what you're doing. Ask your doctor for a prescription for the Freestyle Libre 14-day system. You can do it without finger sticks. Learn more at freestylelibre.us. If you're off the roads for all of us, Farmers is here for you. And if you're on the roads for us, well, we're here for you too. NBC's Tom Costello got an exclusive interview today with a woman who has volunteered for a human trial of a coronavirus vaccine at New York University's medical school. Here's Tom Costello's report. Researchers at NYU have now started clinical trials on a never-before-tried genetic vaccine candidate developed by Pfizer along with a German partner. Rather than trying to manipulate the live virus itself, this vaccine attempts to reprogram the virus's genetic code. Melissa Hunkinen, whose husband is a doctor at NYU, is among the first 12 healthy Americans to receive the injection. So many people 